What we want to talk about today is how to use Quick Fielder for high voltage applications. And although I'm going to be using the electrostatics module, many of the things and tools I discuss are applicable to the other modules too. There are two different modes of setting up uh, problems with Quick Field. One is a, is a plain parallel problem. And in that case, the problem is 2D. The X is along the horizontal axis, and the Y is the vertical axis. And uh, in this case, anything that's drawn on the screen projects out of the screen. So this is good for parallel plate problems and simple coaxial problems with no end terminations or variation along the axis. The other mode or model class that you can set up is, is uh, axisymmetric instead. And in this case, I like to characterize this as uh, 2.5D, sort of in between 2D and 3D. In this case, the horizontal axis is the z-axis, and the vertical axis is the r or radial axis. And so uh, anything that's created in the model space is symmetric about the z-axis. So this is good for coaxial problems, uh, and you can also represent axial variation or terminations at the ends. And you can also do some spherical problems in this case, so it's good for some approximations of 3D. So there are also some things you want to take into account in setting up the model. One, you want to be sure that the model isn't set up below the horizontal axis. And you want to make sure it's positioned correctly with respect to the axis and the origin. It's also possible to import models from other CAD systems, but if you do that, you need to be careful of other features coming along that aren't necessarily useful and can cause issues in quick field. Things like uh, material hatching to show definition of materials in some CAD programs. Um, the hatching generally needs to be eliminated, otherwise quick field thinks that's a feature in the, in the model. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, mesh sizing. And this is an important aspect of, of quick field and how the model is set up and solved. If the mesh is too small, it can take a very long time to solve and, and sometimes will we'll bog down the program pretty significantly. If the mesh is too big, the solution can sometimes be not accurate. So there are certain things you can do uh, to mitigate that. You can avoid meshing parts of the model where it's unnecessary. Um, what you're looking at now is a is a plane parallel setup of a coaxial cable, and so the center conductor is in the region here. This middle section is the polyethylene insulation, and then the outside diameter is where the braid of the cable would be. So, in the section where the semiconductor or where the the center conductor is, there's no need to mesh this since the fields won't penetrate into the metal in this region. So the only region we really need to match is this region right here. And we can do that just like that. The other things you can do are to use the default or the large mesh size where the fields are not of interest or you expect them to be low in value. And then you can use a finer mesh where you are interested in, in uh, specific areas of the fields, and you expect them to be higher. Finally, the last thing you can do is to reduce the problem size uh, where it's symmetric. As you can see, in this case, we're looking at a 90 degree section of the full coaxial cross section. You could also potentially cut that down to a smaller pie section and, uh, again, limit the, the number of mesh elements uh, and simplify the design even further. The last thing you can do in terms of mesh sizing is that QuickField provides a, what's called adaptive mesh refinement. And this is a way to iterate and optimize the mesh size to the problem and the solution. And I'll go over a, an example of that in, in just a minute and show you how you can do that. So just kind of skipping back for a second, um, when I first uh, started to use QuickField, one of the things I decided to do to familiarize myself with it and get some practice and confidence in the, result, in the results was to generate some simple problems with known analytical answers. And so 
uh, my website has a, has a number of these different um, geometries, and it also shows the equations for the, the maximum fields in these cases. And so that's basically what I did, was you set up a number of different or, or similar problems in quick field and solve the problem there, and then compare it to the analytical or calculated answer that you could obtain from these equations. Um, so that's just a, a means I used, like I say, to, to get practice and familiarity with the software and ensure that what I was doing was the correct way to set up the problem and achieve the, the accurate results that I wanted. So we'll go back to this initial example problem. And again, this is a coaxial cable. It's RG220. The center conductor diameter is a little over a quarter of an inch. This outside diameter is about 0.91 inches. And this is the outer edge of the polyethylene insulation. So the cable braid would begin at, at about this point. And this cable is rated at about 14 kV RMS. And what I've done in this case is apply a high voltage on the center conductor of about 35 kV. And I know from past experience that the cable will support this. Uh, and in fact, I've seen applications where it's actually being run at, at higher voltages than that. So the ground is out here at the outer boundary, the high voltage on the inner edge, uh, again, where the center conductor is. And we can run that and solve it. And you can see there are the results. And in this case, it's just a little over 8 megavolts per meter. And you can see the highest fields are, are right on the edge of the center conductor. So what I, I can do, again, using the adaptive meshing, is you can uh, find that a couple ways. It's in the pull-down menu here. You can use this. Or you can also see it's in the, it's in the problem set up here. So we can click on that. We can define the minimum number of refinements and the maximum. In this case, the maximum that it will allow you is, is 10. And what I'm going to do is set 0 here for the maximum mesh node number and allow QuickField to determine that itself. So we'll go ahead and let that run. And you can see it's going through a number of different iterations here. And the mesh is becoming finer and finer, particularly at the, at the inner diameter surface. So now we can look at the results again. And you can see the maximum field now has, has gone up in value from closer to 8 megavolts per meter to now almost 8.5. So we've gotten a little bit better accuracy with, with the finer mesh, um, again, particularly at the, at the uh, ID where, where the fields are highest. Um, and that value... Uh, is, is essentially the exact same value as, as you would get if you calculated using the equations um, on the web page. So just a couple other things um, I would point out. Again, this that field stress is, is uh, it's within the dielectric capabilities of the cable. Um, the thing you start to worry about is you can see even at the outer edge of the cable, it's creeping up towards about uh, 3 megavolts per meter. And that's getting up very close to the, the corona onset voltage or, or breakdown threshold for air insulation. So given the fact that you can have small air gaps between the, the dielectric material and the braid material, you could start to see corona develop at, at this OD of the insulation. And we can, we can check that in this case Again, by setting the minimum here at the 3 megavolts per meter. And you can see it's not quite there yet, but if the voltage goes up any higher, we're going to start to see that those fields there get up to that threshold. And so that might be a problem for the cable. And in, in real life, uh, some cable manufacturers will apply a layer of semiconducting material directly on the dielectric at that point. And that's part of the reasoning behind that, is that it'll help avoid these issues. Then the, the semiconducting material um, will uh, will avoid the, 
the corona inception there since it is at the ground potential. 